Hello and welcome to the Let's Talk Thyroid podcast. This is episode 67. I am Annabelle Bateman and I'm your host today. And today is a conversation between you and I all about a very, very common problem for people with thyroid conditions and that is sleep. Now, I don't know about you, but I have had over my lifetime lots of different issues with sleep and it's been interesting to be able to reflect back and actually make some connections to those issues and my thyroid health. And I can go way back, even as a little girl, I used to have trouble falling asleep. Uh, So this is something that, you know, I would really love for the podcast to have an expert, a sleep expert, a thyroid health sleep expert come onto the show. I haven't found one yet. I'm not saying they don't exist. There are, there is lots out there about thyroid and sleep. Uh, so let's consider this episode like a beginner's guide or an introduction or thyroid health and sleep basics. And with a view that, you know, we can explore this deeper in future episodes with a sleep expert. That's what I would really like to do, but let's lay, lay the foundations because I think that's important too. And I know so many of you who listen are relatively new to thyroid health problems relatively newly diagnosed and so maybe you're trying to connect all the dots uh, yourself. Uh, So let's dive into this topic. Uh, Like I said, this is going to be um, an introduction. I am in the show notes um, going to link lots of different articles that you can go and do some follow-up reading uh, if sleep is an issue for you or depending on what aspect of sleep you're wanting to explore. So from the outset, I want to say sleep is complicated. It shouldn't be. You think sleep is a natural part of life and it's an essential part of life. And yet so many, 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 many millions of people around the world struggle with sleep. So sleep is complicated. Well, the reasons people don't sleep well are complicated. And if you've been listening to this for any length of time, this podcast, you'll know that thyroid health is complex as well. So whether you've got as you know, a autoimmune thyroid condition like Hashimoto's or Graves, whether you've got, or you've had your thyroid removed due to thyroid cancer or, uh, or from having Graves disease, where it doesn't matter what your thyroid problem is, it's complicated. <laughs> it's whole body. Every single cell in your body needs thyroid hormone to function. So, uh, when something goes wrong, you know, we're a whole body, it compensates, we make do, but it's complicated. So when you combine sleep problems and thyroid problems where you're left with a whole range of ridiculous complexity. In fact, there should be a book on the topic. I did actually go looking uh, in preparation for this podcast. I didn't find one specifically on sleep and thyroid health. So who knows, maybe that's another book uh, for someone down the track uh, or, you know, when kiss and make up with your thyroid is well and truly established and Thousands and thousands of copies have been sold across the world. Maybe I can dive into a book on sleep and thyroid. But let's just understand that, you know, because thyroid thyroid hormones impact every cell of your body, uh, there's lots of different ways that that can impact on sleep. And so from the very beginning, I would say if you have a sleep problem, and you have a thyroid problem, the very first thing you need to do is make sure that your thyroid health is being well managed. Preferably that your thyroid hormone levels are in optimum range, at least within normal, if not optimum ranges, and that you're dealing with the autoimmune aspect if you've got autoimmune thyroid conditions. So that is you're reducing inflammation, you've changed, making some changes to diet and lifestyle, implementing the core Four pillars that I talk about in Kiss and Make Up with Your Thyroid, which are mindset, unwinding food and low tox living. So that all will help to dampen that inflammatory impact of having the autoimmune as- aspect. So we do need to make sure that, that our thyroid health and our autoimmune health is good because Otherwise, it's a little bit like playing whack-a-mole. And I know that in and of itself is a lifelong journey. So this is where it's complicated. It's, you know, we just chip away. And, um, but know that if your thyroid health is not good, then it's going to make it so much harder to actually deal with the sleep problems. 
so I just wanted to get that, um, that sort of, it's not quite a disclaimer, although it is, because I think like with all aspects of thyroid health, you can't just deal with the symptoms. You do have to deal with the underlying causes, sometimes simultaneously. But let's just have a look at some of, well, these are the way, the way I want to structure today's podcast. So we're going to talk about the core issues with sleep for the hypothyroid patient. I am going to touch on the hyperthyroid symptoms as well. Uh, we're going to talk about some hormonal impact. We're going to talk about the different types of sleep problems, primarily difficulty falling asleep and then waking up in the night and not being able to get back to sleep. And then we're going to talk about some solutions, some lots of different things to try, uh, both some supplements, some things to do before bed, in the bedroom, those, those type of solutions. Now, the show notes for this should be pretty uh, thorough. Uh, I've made lots of notes in preparation for this. So if there's an aspect that you want to dive into, just go to the show notes, which will be linked to the podcast. So Annabelle Bateman slash podcast, find this podcast episode, which is 67, and you'll find that there. And watch the social media uh, for the next week or so, because I'll pull out core parts for social media as well. Now, I'll start with the hyperthyroid, actually, uh, and some of these overlap, which is common, again, if you've looked at the different symptom, common symptoms between hyper and hypothyroid, uh, there are some similarities. So again, make sure you know what's going on with your thyroid, that you're working with a doctor who knows about thyroid health and can at least diagnose you properly and then treat you well. So hyper, that's the overactive. So when you think about overactive thyroid, everything's revved up. Everything is, um, yeah, it's revved up. It's going faster. So think about trying to go to bed all revved up. <laughs> it's very hard to wind down to sleep. So some of the symptoms of hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease, which is the autoimmune hyper, hyperthyroid disease, you've got things like racing heart anxiousness that really kind of wound up and that nervous, you know, that nervous tension. So you have a lot of difficulty winding down because your body is all revved up. Uh, night terrors can come along with hyperthyroidism, complete exhaustion because your body's sort of working on overtime. So, um, you know, your muscles are exhausted and and you're hyperactive at the same time. So that they're kind of common things that you can, even without thinking too deeply, we know that those things are going to impact on your ability to sleep. So you do need to make sure then that's being looked at. Now, common hypothyroid symptoms um, that relate to sleep are things like cold extremities. So our fingers and toes um, can get quite cold. It's winter here in Brisbane. Now, winter in Brisbane is not really winter compared to many of you who live around the world who live in actual cold climates, uh, but it still gets cold and my fingers and toes still get cold. But if you can't get them warm, that can actually impede your ability to fall asleep. So cold extremities, restless legs often goes with um, hyper, high, being hypothyroid. Uh, so, you know, that's where you, you know, you're tired and your legs start to twitch and you can't control the twitching. So that's common and that can in, interfere with sleep. Joint and muscle pain. Uh, can't find a comfortable sleeping position. You know, your shoulder hurts, your knee hurts, your back hurts, your hip hurts, your feet hurt. I've had all of those things hurt at different points in time, so I totally understand that. And that can, you know, be quite disruptive to sleep. Sleep apnea is very common actually with hypothyroidism and we'll come to that in terms of the solutions, but just be aware that sleep apnea can be an issue. Uh, obesity. Now we know that one of the struggles with hyperthyroidism is, uh, is with our metabolism and our ability to lose weight. So if you do tend to be um, really struggling with that and just know that carrying that extra weight can impact on your sleep and it can connect, connect in with the sleep apnea. Uh, anxiety uh, and depression go both with hyper and hypothyroidism um, and that can get in the way <laughs> of being able to fall asleep, stay asleep, wake up in the night, all those things. Um, so that, that, that mental health component plays a big role. Uh, again, weak muscles. So if your muscles across your body aren't getting enough thyroid hormone to function properly, 
uh, you know, in a, particularly in extreme examples, your weak muscles can impact on your res- your respiratory muscles, so your ability to actually breathe properly. You can't breathe properly. You're gonna have difficulty sleeping. Uh, and an enlarged tongue. So again, that's a good symptom of hyper, not good symptom, but it's a, it's a symptom of hypothyroidism, particularly if it's not being managed well. And if you've got a really enlarged tongue, you know, that's going to restrict your um, breathing and your airways. So that's going to impact on your sleep. So <laughs> there's probably more, but they're the core things. And some of those are symptoms that if you perhaps are listening to this and you don't know that you've got a thyroid problem, but you're ticking all these boxes in terms of sleep symptoms or struggles, then go get your thyroid checked. They, they can actually be warning signs that your thyroid's not working properly. So they are in and of themselves a good indication to go, look, I need to get to the bottom of this. You know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Have we got, you know, and I often think, well, whichever one you believe comes first, the chicken or the egg is often the thyroid problems. I mean, yes, we've got lots of underlying things, but once you've got a thyroid problem, it impacts so many other aspects of your health. So go get that checked. Now, um, all right, so they're the core issues that we can have, like the hyper, hypo. I just want to talk about some hormone-related symptoms. So if you haven't already listened to the episode, a couple, only a couple of episodes ago with Sophie Sophie Shepard talking all about hormones and thyroid. This sort of relates a lot to that because if our other hormones aren't in balance how they should be, then that's good impact with sleep. So we need both estrogen and progesterone for sleep. Uh, So estrogen helps with anxiety and lack of estrogen, you know, particularly this is often what causes the hot flashes during that perimenopause period. So Um, but estrogen dominance is also linked to hypothyroidism. So if estrogen's out of whack, either high or low, that can impact on sleep. Progesterone, um, I didn't realize this, but progesterone produces the neurotransmitter GABA, which is really important for calming. So again, if our progesterone is off, then that could impact on our ability to calm and settle and sleep. Melatonin. Now, I'm not sure that melatonin technically is a hormone, Uh, but uh, melatonin is definitely involved in thyroid function. It's kind of commonly known as the sleep hormone, but uh, yeah, like I said, um, and you know, it's, it's something that comes and goes in, you know, it comes and goes in ways, but it, it is connected in with our circadian rhythm. And if your circadian rhythm is out, then often your melatonin levels are going to be out. Uh, one of the things I have learned, well, actually it comes to the solutions. I, I have personally found melatonin incredibly helpful for sleep, uh, but we'll come to that when we come to supplements. There is a really interesting lady uh, that is worth following. If you want to dive right into melatonin, not just for sleep, but for a whole range of other health benefits. Uh, she's a researcher into melatonin and ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C. Uh, her name is Doris Lowe, L-O-H. Now, she has an amazing Facebook page. And I look honestly, I don't understand most of what she writes, but melatonin is pretty powerful. Um, and so, you know, if you want to dive into melatonin, I'll just throw that out as an aside. Go follow Doris Lowe. Now, one of the ways, uh, one of the tricks, or well, tricks, I suppose, that's not quite the right word, one of the The things that you can do to increase your melatonin at night apparently is to eat cherries. So uh, need to find some cherries in winter, I'm not sure. But in summer, (laughs) that could be a good option. But just know that if your melatonin is is out, then that can impact on your sleep. The other one core um, hormone that can impact sleep is cortisol. And this is a whole, like we, we talked quite a bit about cortisol in the episode with Sophie Shepard. Uh, from my research, this is a whole, <laughs> could be another whole book, is cortisol and blood sugar uh, in connection to sleep. But just know that if your blood sugar is low, then that can cause cortisol to spike. And that could mean that you, you know, waking up, like a sign of that can be that you wake up come in the middle of the night in a panic, like, or you kind of wake up out of a dream. That can be your blood sugar going down, your cortisol spikes and ah, you kind of wake up, which has actually happened to me a couple of times 
um, I've kind of woken up with a jolt in the middle of the night. So now I know that I might go back and actually, if it happens again, look at what did I eat for dinner? When did I last eat? You know what? Try to work that one out. High levels of cortisol are also connected to high levels of TSH. That is being in a hypothyroid state. Remember, we don't want our TSH to be high. We certainly don't want it to be too high. And so if we've got those high levels of cortisol, which often come with chronic states of stress. Now we know that cortisol is important. <laughs> um, some stress is important in our in our lives, but that chronic state of kind of being permanently in a state of chronic stress, not helpful. And that is connected to um, increased cortisol, which increases TSH, which leads to hypothyroidism. So again, it feels like this podcast should be the thyroid and stress podcast because so much of what we talk about ends up coming back to stress. And if we don't learn to manage stress, if we don't learn to set boundaries, take on less, um, maybe you know, prioritize some of these core self-care um rituals or practices, then, you know, it just throws everything out. So that was the, that was the hormonal aspect. So making sure that our estrogen, progesterone, melatonin, and cortisol are doing what they should and are at the kind of the levels that they should be. And if any of those things are out, then they, they can interrupt our sleep. Now we're going to move on to the, the two main issues with sleep and that is the falling asleep and then the waking up once you are asleep. Now I asked about if people had questions in the Let's Talk Thyroid community on Facebook and um, the, a few of the questions related to the nighttime waking. So Jeff, I've done a lot of research into that. So we'll come to that. And if that's your problem, I will highly recommend going and doing some more digging into, into that because um, yeah, that, I think that's some really interesting things when it comes to nighttime waking. But let's talk about difficulty falling asleep. Personally, this has been my bigger issue with sleep is generally once I'm asleep, I stay asleep. But for as, you know, on and off for as long as I can remember, I've had difficulty falling asleep. Now, um, I'm going to give you some of the common reasons why that is. And when we come to the solutions, we'll talk about some options, some different things to try. I've tried a lot. I've probably tried everything in the list over time. Um, and just like diet and other aspects of the thyroid friendly lifestyle, you have to find what's going to work for you. And it's a lot of trial and error and it's a lot of time and different things will work at different times. And that's okay. That's just the nature of the beast. That's just what it is. Um, that's part of the mindset is accepting, um, that it's not easy. It's going to take time. You know, there'll be some ups and downs, but don't give up. <laughs> don't give up. All right. So difficulty falling asleep. Um, a core, well, there's a few physical things and there's, there's some emotional things. So physically things that can get in the way of falling asleep would be some of those symptoms that we talked about before, things like cold extremities, pain. So that's where we've got to deal with those. I'm not going to go into that now, um, but also things like caffeine. So maybe not having, I think caffeine has a half-life I read of about six hours. So think about that in terms of your caffeine intake. Personally, I find if I have caffeine after about 11 or 12 a.m., um, then it impacts on my sleep. So I can have a coffee early in the morning and I'm fine, but if I have it later than that, it does impact on my sleep. So definitely if you're having trouble falling asleep and you're having caffeine in the afternoon, evening, you might want to pair that back. Just also remembering that there is caffeine in chocolate and caffeine in decaf coffee. So we do need to be a bit careful about those, particularly if we're super sensitive to caffeine. Alcohol. Now, this is one that increasingly is, a, is an issue for me, which is, um, I mean, I don't really drink that much, but it is nice every now and again to have a glass of wine or a gin and tonic, but increasingly I find that it impacts on my ability to fall asleep. So be aware of that, that if you, particularly if you're drinking regularly, um, that could be impacting on your ability to fall asleep. 
uh, the food that you're eating before you go to bed or at dinner time could be impacting. Like if you're eating food that is giving you heartburn or reflux or making you feel bloated, uh, then that's going to cause discomfort, which is going to cause you difficulty falling asleep. So that goes back to, well, maybe we deal with the, you know, taking out some of those inflammatory foods or those foods that are working out for you, what it is that's causing you that discomfort uh, and not eating too close to bedtime. Um, the re- general recommendation is that you shouldn't eat for three hours before you go to bed. So just being mindful of how late you're eating as well. So they're, they're all just physical things that can impact on your ability to fall asleep. Um, now the emotional uh reasons are probably the things that, um, well, they've certainly been issues for me. One is, you know, it's just that anxiety, that anxiety, the overthinking, even being overtired. And that sort of, I guess that borders on the physical, doesn't it? But if you've got lots on your mind, uh, you are that type A personality, that thyroid personality we've talked about before. And if that's a new term, go back and listen to the podcast on having a thyroid personality. Uh, or read the section in my book. I've written about it in there too. But that type A driven personality usually is prone to overthinking, anxiety, stress, um, a gazillion things on the to-do list, always thinking about tomorrow, what's on, lots of tabs open in your brain or on your computer or both all at once. (laughs) And so you're, you're just, your brain then has trouble winding down to put those things aside so you can actually fall asleep. So just be mindful that if that is your tendency, it certainly is mine, then that can be getting in the way of you falling asleep. Perhaps having a journal next to your bed can help with that. Um, I will come to the solutions, won't we? Uh, But just be mindful that those things, um, if your GABA and your melatonin um, can be out of balance, that can have difficulty uh, impact on your falling asleep and high cortisol level. So that sort of ties back into what we were looking at before or talking about before. So that's the difficulty falling asleep. The next one is waking up in the night. Now this seems to be a problem. This was the one that people asked most about in the group was waking up in the night. So this is you've fallen asleep, but then you wake up and then you have trouble getting back to sleep. Now, there's a few key things that came up in my research about this. And the three key ones were low blood sugar, and we'll come back to that in a minute, uh, liver issues. And the, the liver issues kind of tie a little bit into some research I did that came up into the Chinese medicine body clock. And I'll talk about that. So they're the three aspects I'm just about to go over. And just remember again, this is an overview. So this is, um, if there's something that piques your interest, go away and do that research into that aspect. So this should be a bit like a springboard episode, should give you plenty to go, right, well, this is the aspect of sleep I'm struggling with. I'm going to research that, that go out and research that or try a few different things. So let's just just bear that in mind. This is not a total, I wish it was a total solution. I wish there was a total solution to thyroid health. I wish there was a protocol. I wish, I just wish there was. <laughs> it's just not. So in terms of waking up in the night, one of the reasons you could be waking up in the night is low blood sugar, which like I said before, that activates the stress response and that can cause you to wake up and sometimes wake up in a panic. Um, so there's that, there's that at the low blood sugar and then it triggers the stress response and you can wake up. Um, if you're waking up between 2.30 and 4 a.m., that can be a sign of low blood sugar. So even if you haven't kind of woken up in a jolt, it could be that your body's response to that low blood sugar is to wake you up. And if you're waking up between that 2.30 and 4, then that can be that sign of the low blood sugar. Also, apparently your adrenaline naturally rises between two and three. So just be aware of that too. Now, if you do find that you're waking up between 2.30 and 4, I'll dive straight into the solutions to this, is making sure that before, right before you go to bed, now I know this is about to contradict the not eating three hours before bed. So, you know, this is where it's no one size fits all. Um, 
make sure you're having a snack before you go to bed that's high protein, good fat snack. So like a handful of almonds or a bit of almond butter, um, that kind of snack, maybe a boiled egg, just to help balance your blood sugars through the night. The other thing that you can do is if you do wake in the night, just have a little bowl full of you know, almonds or nuts next to your bed and just have a couple without even having to get out of bed. You don't want to have to get out of bed because that again is going to wake you up more. But if you can have something just next to the bed, try, you know, eat a handful of nuts, maybe drink a little bit of water, wash them down. Don't want you choking on nuts in the, in the middle of the night, but, and see if that helps. Now, one of the <coughs> interesting little things i read uh, in a great article from Forefront Health, and I am going to link that in the show notes, is about drinking salted orange juice. Now, I haven't tried this one, so I don't know, but apparently there's a combination of that little bit of sweet and a bit of salty that can help uh, balance the blood sugars before you you go to bed. So like drinking, what was it, 30 mils of salted orange juice um, just before you go to bed and then keeping a little bit again next to your bed so you can have a sip if you wake up in the night. Like I said, I haven't tried that one, but I will link the article so you can read all about that. So that's one of the core reasons that people wake up in the night is low blood sugar. Another one is liver issues. Now, liver and thyroid is another whole massive topic, and uh, I'm going to find someone to talk about that one um, on the show. I know for me personally, I'm always doing something to work on my liver health in part because I don't have a gallbladder. Now that's another whole topic. (laughs) So many topics with thyroid health. Um, But because I don't have a gallbladder, my, and a lot of people with thyroid issues have had their gallbladders out. So there is a connection. But even if you have your gallbladder, your liver is processing um, all your chemicals, you know, your, your food, it's the filter, right? So Um, and your liver is a core place where your thyroid hormones are converted. So we want to make sure our liver is always in good health, optimal health. The liver is going to be processing any alcohol you've drunk at night. It is also connected with emotions, um, particularly anger and unresolved resentment, which ties into the Chinese medicine body clock. Well, I'll come to that. So just know that overnight, um, your liver is doing all of that restorative work. So if you've load, overloaded your liver in the sense of you've maybe you've eaten, you know, sugary processed food for dinner, you've you know followed it up with a glass of wine or had a glass of wine with dinner and followed it up with, with an, um, a yummy dessert. Maybe you you know you're still you know drinking tap water and you've got chemicals around your body and your hair care and your shampoos and some of those extra toxins, then your liver has to deal with that. And it does that overnight as you sleep. And if it's under extra heavy load, that can actually impact on your sleep. Now, interestingly, if you dive into the Chinese medicine body clock, and again, just Google that, you'll find that in Chinese medicine, they have identified different time periods throughout the well, throughout the whole day, but if we just focus on the nighttime ones and how they relate to different body systems. Now, this is um, Eastern medicine. There's um, In the research I did, there's not a lot of studies to confirm this, but so just take this however you would like to take it. But just, again, it's another thing to bear in mind if you're having trouble um, sleeping or waking up in the night, particularly with the night waking. So talking about the liver, it, uh, according to the Chinese medicine body clock, the, the body is dealing, processing with, um, kind of focused, I guess, on the liver during the period of 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. So again, that ties in with what we we're talking about before, even with the low blood sugar and that waking between that sort of, that, well, that, sort of, you know, one to three time zone. Now your liver is responsible for pro- emotionally dealing with anger and stress. There's that stress again, resentment, um, like I said before, processing alcohol. Um, so if you're waking up between that 1am and 3am, then just be aware that could be connected to your liver emotionally and physically, uh, you know, just as that time zone. Now, 
just to give you a little bit of context around those areas as well, like from, and I'll put this in the, sh- I should put this in the show notes. It'll definitely be on social media. Uh, I'll do a little graph. But from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., so you think that's probably when we sh- should be going to bed and falling asleep, is when our body is balancing out the endocrine system and our metabolic function. So that is thyroid and adrenals, right? So, um, that, so that's pretty core time for us to be unwinding and going to bed and getting to sleep. Between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m., that's the gallbladder according to Chinese medicine. So again, gallbladder, liver, so that, and that, so that's 11 to one, one till three is liver. So if you think about that 11 PM to 3 AM, that's core kind of gallbladder, liver, so they're core functions for thyroid support. Then from 3 AM to 5 AM is lung, is the lung. And so, you know, maybe if you're having trouble breathing or processing grief, um, And waking up between those hours, then that, you know, according to Chinese medicine, that could be worth looking at that aspect of your health. So that's the night waking. I just found that really interesting. And I think when we see more and more the connection between our emotions and our physical health, then, you know, we should be paying attention to those things. But, you know, the low blood sugar makes a big difference as well. Now, now we're coming to some solutions and solutions probably might be um, maybe options, <laughs> ideas, remedies, things to try might be a better heading rather than solutions because who knows whether these are going to actually solve your sleep problem, but they're worth giving a go, right? Now there's a few, I've broken them into category, three categories, well four really. The first is, you know, some provisos and then we've got supplements and herbs preparing for bed and then our sleep environment, like once we're actually in bed. Again, these are not things you have to do all of. I will list these in the show notes. So go and, you know, have a look there. These are just different options of things to try. But first of all, the provisos are that you're getting your thyroid health managed well, that your thyroid hormones are optimal, or you're working towards that with someone who knows how to help you do that. So, Usually that's an integrative doctor and or a naturopath, um, you know, someone who really understands thyroid health. And if you think perhaps you could be having a sleep issue like sleep apnea, you're waking up in the night, you're waking up really exhausted. And now I know that can be a hypothyroid sy- symptom. Um, it could be worth doing a sleep study just to rule that in or out. Because we want to make sure, you know, sleep apnea is when you stop breathing. <laughs> you do need to breathe uh, for full body function, obviously. So it might be worth doing a sleep study just to rule those that in or out. And again, that's something you need to talk about with your doctor. So assuming that you're doing all of those things, uh, here are some supplements and herbs. And obviously, like I'm not medically trained I'm not a naturopath. These are things that I've come across in my reading. Some of them are things that I've taken or take. Uh, but again, you shouldn't be taking supplements um, really without looking at any deficiencies and working with a natural health practitioner. But these are just things to be on the, the lookout for, I suppose. So melatonin is one. And like I said before, um, I mean, that could be a bit controversial, melatonin. It doesn't work for everyone. I know for some people it gives them... Uh, bad dreams or they don't sleep well with it. But for me personally, it's been a complete game changer. Now there are still some nights that I have trouble falling asleep, but that's usually when something else is going on. Like um, the other night I had six 16 year old boys watching movies and (laughs) um, staying the night and they're good kids. And it just was different. It was out. it, It was something else going on in the house when I was trying to go to sleep and it just took me longer to fall asleep. Actually, while I'm thinking about that, because this is something I've had to do, going back to the, if you have trouble falling asleep, there are times, and it still happens to me occasionally, where I just feel like I'm awake all night, like I'm trying to fall asleep and I can't fall asleep. And then I get worried that I'm not sleeping and like, what am I going to do? How am I going to function? What if I don't, what if I don't fall asleep? I'm not going to be able to do anything like I'm going to be in a brain fog and I won't be able to achieve what I need to tomorrow. And like that whole mental process, <laughs> overthinking 
goes on. So I've taught myself over time to lie there and, and basically say to myself, it doesn't matter if I don't sleep. I can survive for a night without sleep. It actually is okay. I'm just going to lie here and rest. And I've had to change that mindset. And it's like, and it's doing it in a, on a regular basis in that, like in the moment. So I'm not saying it's a set and forget, but I try not to worry about the fact that I'm falling asleep, not falling asleep because that has kept me awake all night before. So if I find I'm getting in that pattern, I just have to, it's okay. It's all right. If I don't sleep, it's fine. If I just rest, I'm just going to lie here and I'm just going to you know, practice my breathing or I'm just, I'm just going to lie here. And if I drift off to sleep, that's fine. And if I don't, that's okay. I'll be all right. And rather than working myself up into a panic that I'm not sleeping and it's going to be terrible. I'm going to have a terrible day the next day and I'm never, I'm not going to be able to function and all of that. (laughs) Um, So I just wanted to, I meant to say that earlier. So I just wanted to put that out there, but back to the supplements. So melatonin can be really helpful for a lot of people here in Australia. It used to be, you have to be prescribed. They seem to change the rules around melatonin. I find getting it, I buy it now through iHerb, um, which ships to Australia It's about, I think on the prescription when I was, when it had to be prescribed, I was paying something like $90 for probably 30 mils. Now it's it's about $8 from iHerb, 12, something like that. So it's so much cheaper. It's ridiculous. Um, So highly recommend if you're going to try that again, you should be doing that in conjunction with your doctor, which I am, but um, melatonin can help. Magnesium, very common supplement um, that seems to help with, winding the body down and sleep. So again, if you're taking that internally, deal with, work with your practitioner, it can be really nice to um, use as a foot bath or in a bath um, or even magnesium spray or gel. uh, If you've got um, tired, twitchy muscles that, uh, that often benefit from magnesium. Ashwagandha is an adaptogenic herb that again, some people with um, particularly Hashimoto's do well with some don't, but that can, that sort of fits in that, often recommended, you know, to explore in the context of sleep. Things like passion flower, lemon balm, chamomile, um, well, chamomile is a herb, yeah, herb, L-theanine, NAC. Um, they're all herbs and supplements that commonly um, go with sleep. I use a supplement that I get from doTERRA called Serenity Soft Gels. It's got some of those things in it. It's got passion flower, lemon balm, lavender, L-theanine. It's just a nice restful blend. I don't take it every night, but if I know that I've had a busy day, maybe I've been out at night and had lots of stimulating conversation and I know I need to wind my brain down. I'll take one or two of those and the melatonin that just helps to wind me down. Talking about essential oils, there are lots of beautiful, calming essential oils that are beautiful for sleep and rest, you know, just preparing for sleep, winding your body down, getting into that restful state. So essential oils like, or lavender is a common one, although that's not my favorite. Vetiver is a root essential oil, and that's very deeply calming and grounding. Uh, Often your wood oils, so things like cedarwood, sandalwood, they can be nice for sleep. Uh, magnolia is another floral oil, a bit like lavender. It's actually got more, oh, I'm talking off the top of my head now. Uh, the core component in lavender, which escapes me right now, is also in magnolia and is higher in magnolia. So magnolia is a really lovely uh, nighttime essential oil. So there's lots of different ones. Um, obviously chamomile and some of those herbs that can be taken as herbs or essential oils, or even in a tea, like a chamomile tea. So just know that there are those beautiful natural options that can be part of a nighttime routine. So that leads us on to preparing for bed. Now, actually preparing for bed uh, can start first thing in the morning. (laughs) So part of setting our circadian clocks is to get exposure to morning sun. Now, preferably sunrise, getting outside early in the morning and just, you know, not staring at the sun, but looking towards the sun, getting that early morning light into our eyes actually helps to set the circadian rhythm for the, pardon me, for the day. So just getting outside, (coughs) being active during the day, 
sorry, my throat just went a bit funny. Getting active during the day, you know, having those regular get up and go to bed times. They can be helpful. Like we talked about before, no caffeine in the afternoons and the evening and watching what you eat and the alcohol. Um, wearing red light glasses. And again, I'll put a photo. I've got some, I've tried different ones over time. And I've got to say, I, I do that in fits and starts, but wearing red light blocking glasses at night when we're inside under artificial light, looking at artificial light on TV screens and phones and you know, laptops and all of that. It, it tricks your body into thinking it's daytime when it's still, when it's nighttime and we should be winding down for sleep according to our circadian clock. So wearing red glasses that block out that, um, they're called blue blockers, but they block out that blue light at night can help to wind your brain and your body down for sleep. So that could be worth trying. If you haven't tried that, give that a go. In the evening, just doing some winding down activities. So I find for me just watching some mindless TV, fictional, you know, some sort of TV series that just switches my brain off from thinking about real life. Uh, I find that really helpful. We, so Lee and I will usually just watch an episode of a series that we're watching and that just helps to switch my brain off from what's going on today, what's happening tomorrow, you know, you know, all the you know bigger issues in the world that I might be thinking about just help switch all those things off. You might like to have a bath, uh, like I said before, having a nice bath with some magnesium flakes or Epsom salts, um, maybe adding a calming essential oil just to wind down. That can help at night or a foot bath if you don't want to have a whole bath. I find we've got an infrared sauna and um, having a sauna at night, I often find that quite helpful for having a good night's sleep too. So there are some of the things that you can do as you're winding down. And then when you're actually, you know, looking at going to bed, having that sleep routine is really helpful. So whether that's a bit like with the kids, you know, bath, book, bed, having that routine or having a routine is good. Uh, the environment of your room is important. So it should be dark, you know, you should be blocking out as much uh, night light, like street lights or lights from other rooms in the house as much as possible. You might even like to wear one of those nice bedtime silky masks. That can help block out a bit of extra light as well. Uh, the room should be cool. And now if you've got cold extremities, you might need to play around with this. But um, if you sleep in a cool room, that helps you to have a better sleep. Electronics should ideally not be in the bedroom. Now, um, I must admit my phone is not in my bedroom and I turn the phone off in the night. So no notifications or bells or whistles <laughs> are coming on even from a, another room or I would still hear them and that would disrupt my sleep. So keeping phones out of the room, I do read on an iPad, which I know is not ideal. Um, so ideally you would have all electronics out of your bedroom. So, but I'm not going to pretend I do that. Uh, I have the iPad, I have the brightness down low. If I'm reading, I have black background, white light, words. So it's fairly, it is actually quite dark. Um, but that's me. If you can do without any screens in your bedroom, that is ideal. Um, you might want, like to put a diffuser on in your bedroom and diffuse some nice calming essential oils. Some people really like that at night. Uh, you might like to keep a journal next to your bed. So when you do think of, oh my gosh, I didn't write that thing down that I need to do tomorrow. You can just jot it on a piece of paper next to your bed, gets it out of your head. Then you can just relax knowing you're going to deal with that in the morning. Uh, sometimes reading a good book, but not a great book. So you don't want one of those books that you want to keep reading and reading and reading and reading and going to read it till three o'clock in the morning. So you want a good book, a book that you want to spend, you know, dedicate some time reading, uh, but one that's not going to keep you awake. There's lots of different meditation apps you can try and sleep apps. Uh, again, I guess that involves having some sort of technology in your room to try that, but, you know, maybe I'll let you work that one out. Uh, so that can just help with winding down or talking you through to sleep or so try that if you like it. I've found mm, they have worked for me at different points in time. What I find is just the talking, even if it's soothing, stimulates my brain and I 
it's sort of counterproductive for me mostly, but for some people find it super helpful. So give it a try. Like it might really work for you. The other thing that can work is breathing, different breathing techniques. You'll find a couple of simple ones in my book. Um, there, I will put some links to some, um, sleep, you know, some breathing techniques in the show notes, but yeah, just, just some deep calming breaths, you know, just to calm your mind and your body that can be really helpful before you go to sleep as well. So huh, that's a lot, isn't it? I told you even an introduction to sleep is complicated. Uh, look, I hope, uh, you know, throughout, uh, as you listen to this and engage on social media, I would love it if, if you found like an app or a technique or a, you know, a food or I don't know, anything, a, a, a nice herbal tea that you found really helpful for sleep, I'd love you to share it in some of the social media posts, whether that's in the Lex Talk Thyroid community or on um, Instagram, then please do that because I think that you know, I'm sure all of you listening have different things that have worked for you that I've not even thought of. So the more we share our experiences, the more we learn from each other. And if sleep is a chronic issue for you, please do take it seriously because you actually do need to sleep to heal. Um, you actually do need to sleep for your thyroid to function. And if you are, have chronic insomnia or chronic sleep issues, like where every single night your sleep is not good, then you do need to take it seriously. So go back, maybe work out where you're going to tackle this uh, whilst you're also dealing with your thyroid um, health as well. So like I said before, wish this wasn't complicated, but it is, and that's okay. Because, you know, we're all capable, competent people uh, that are able, we're able to deal with this. It's not, it, whilst it can feel overwhelming when we break it down and just pick one thing. Maybe you're just going to try cutting out coffee, you know, um, at lunchtime. Or maybe you're just going to buy an eye mask and sleep with that. Maybe you'll inhale an essential oil before you go to bed. Maybe you'll go get your thyroid levels tested just to check that everything's in optimal range. Just pick one thing, keep it super simple. Remember the KISS principle, um, keep it super simple so that you don't get overwhelmed and just chip away and over time, we will get there. You'll, you'll see improvements, you'll be able to make changes and different elements will be incorporated into your unique thyroid friendly lifestyle that works for you so that you're feeling good and you've got energy to get about being the amazing person that you're created to be and um, yeah, and just influencing your world for good. But you can't do that or not as well as you could if you're feeling subpar. So it is definitely worth it for you and everyone around you that you are, um, your health is operating as optimally as it can and that you are on that trajectory to feeling fantastic. And if you need help with that, please let me know. I'm here to help. You can always book a strategy session with me where we can kind of help you work out what that one next step is. You know, um, we can sort of cut through that overwhelm and really work out, you know, where, where you're at and where you need help. The other thing that you can do is to buy my book, Kiss and Make Up With Your Thyroid. There's lots of um, practical solutions in there for those across a range of different aspects of your thyroid friendly lifestyle. It's perfect for the person who is either fairly newly diagnosed or new to the whole concept that diet and lifestyle could impact on your thyroid health. Like if you've been told all you need to do is take your thyroid medication, that's it, that's all you can do or you need to do and you're still not feeling great, then this book is perfect for you. Because although there is no thyroid um, protocol, <laughs> I wish there was, uh, you do have to start somewhere. You can't just keep your head in the sand and just take your pills and assume that miraculously you're going to feel better if you've been doing that for a while and you're not feeling better. So you do need to take action. So I like to think of the book as a bit of a springboard. It is like, you know, you've got to start somewhere. So the book will give you, you know, an idea of where that somewhere is for you. But otherwise, have a fabulous uh, fortnight till the Thyroid Podcast uh, lands again in your um, podcast app and I'll see you on social media. 
Thank you so much for watching this episode of Let's Talk Thyroid. I would love it if you enjoyed it, if you would hit subscribe and the bell, that would be really helpful. Uh, even more helpful actually would be to share it with someone else who you know has thyroid issues or you think would benefit from listening. That really is part of my mission, I suppose, is to spread the message of positive and practical approach to managing your thyroid health so that people really kind of have more energy to get on with living their life and not just some kind of trudging through each day. So spreading that word really genuinely helps um, other people feel better, live better, be better. Uh, the best way that you can connect with me is through my um, website, which is annabellebateman.com. From there, really, you'll be able to connect in all the other ways. I would love it if you would join my Facebook community group. Um, there's lots of uh, great support there. It's all free. Uh, that and that's you know just being with like-minded people uh, but from the website you can also book a strategy session with me so if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed not sure not too sure where to start then um, book a strategy session there's also freebies to download and links to look at my online courses or purchase some essential oils or or, one, or my cookbook so that's really the hub would be annabellebateman.com but look forward to connecting with you and um, yeah just being in this thyroid health journey together have a great day bye the information presented and discussed in this podcast is not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease and should not be used as a substitute for proper advice from a qualified professional